So about providence. Firstly, we have a disclaimer. We are making some forward looking statements tonight. So if you can please take account of that uh, as you review the presentation, that would be much appreciated. Provence Resources, we are listed on Euronext and also on NAME. Our market cap in euros is about 64 million at the moment. We have zero debt and we've got about 2.3 million euros in the bank. Uh, we've recently seen the exercise of a number of warrants which we put in place during the, the capital raise that we did back in May, uh, which has actually bolstered our working capital resources. Uh, and we are very encouraged by the response of our shareholders to support the business. Net resource base, uh, we have an 80% interest in Barrier Row. Uh, 2C resources, which are independently verified of 280 million barrels of oil equivalent. Um, by anybody's standards, that uh, is a large field. And I've got some um, information about some of the sizes of fields in the North Sea that are being developed, and you'll see how how we compare and contrast to that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, sorry, just a second, copped it up. There we go. Our strategy, um, Providence was focused primarily on a lot of the deep water west of Ireland exploration that was very much in vogue uh, two or three years ago and was an active player in that market. Um, they weren't really embark embarking upon becoming an operator and wanted to farm out Barry Row to a big player with, with, with strong finances. Uh, they were unsuccessful in, in achieving that and um, that left the company in fairly dire financial circumstances. I was brought in in early January and we did a very early capital raise in order to ensure that we had the funds in place to really allow us to refocus the business. What we've done since the beginning of the year is we have relinquished all of our offshore West of Ireland licenses. Those processes are in process at the moment. They're not all complete, but a number are. And we are now focused solely on the North Celtic Sea, primarily on Barry Row, which is an oil and a gas asset. Again, historically, Providence had really marketed that as a pure oil asset, but um, there's a lot of gas in that structure, which really plays into the developing economy on, uh, with gas as a transition fuel as we move through to renewables. So in addition to the early development of Barry Row, and, um, and we plan to phase that development, and I'll speak more about that, uh, we're also really interested in developing the potential that's next door to us if we can. Um, the Conceal gas fields are now fully depleted and are in the process of getting ready for decommissioning. Uh, the Seven Heads gas field sits directly over Barry Row and the other two gas fields out there, Ballycotton and, and Conceal Head are, um, are very close by. The pipeline runs from Seven Heads directly to the shore. So there's a lot of existing equipment in place uh, that we can play with um, if we have the opportunity. And we believe, <clears throat> and the Conceal Head gas field has been appraised, that the area is suitable for carbon capture and storage. So we believe that by developing Barry Row and producing the oil and the gas, we can provide domestic oil and gas for Ireland rather than importing. Ireland currently imports 100% of its oil and nearly 70% of its gas. The Corrib field is the, the last producing field in Ireland and it's on decline. So Ireland is going to be uh, 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 an energy importer uh, extensively in, in a few years. The Barry Row field has the potential to really help out locally. And if we can do that uh, in an environment where we can also introduce carbon capture and storage and be the offshore operator for the cap and caption and storage, then we do believe that we have a, a really virtuous business model that we can progress. Carbon capture and storage does require government support. Uh, so it's not something that we would step into lightly, but we are doing the work that is required to assess that potential. In addition to Barry Row in the North Celtic Sea, we also have a number of 
uh, appraisal and development opportunities. Uh, we have four discoveries, uh, one gas, three oil. And uh, we do believe that with Barry Road developed, we will have sort of a core hub operational uh, capacity to marginally develop existing discoveries and also begin to progress near field exploration potential. So really there are three legs to this stool, but the thickest and firmest leg, and, and there's no question about the priority, is the Barry Row oil and gas field. I've already really spoken to this slide. The, the four discoveries that we have are Helvig, Hookhead, Dunmore and Dragon in existing licenses within the North Celtic Sea. Um, the Helvig uh, is a particularly interesting discovery. It's been tested, it flowed at 10,000 barrels of oil a day and it's in the Jurassic Sands. What we will be talking about shortly is, is the Barry Row potential and there is a deep exploration potential in Barry Row in those Jurassic Sands. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just need a drink of water. Okay, moving on. As Sarah said in the introduction, Barry Row is one of the largest undeveloped fields in offshore Europe. Just to give an idea of the scale, and I've used um, Irish uh, scale, if you like, to, to um, describe it. Uh, at two, so 271 kilometres squared, Barry Row is twice the area of Dublin and Greater Dublin. So it's a very large aerially uh, placed field. It's about 25 kilometres long and just over 10 kilometres wide. Um, so it's big, there is no question. And structurally, it's also very interesting. The, the red at the top of this little cartoon is the Seven Heads gas field, and it's been producing, or it's, it's, it's ceased producing now, but it produced a, a lot of gas. Uh, beneath that, you see the middle wheeled in sand, which we have appraised and which we carry resources for. Below that, you see the lower wheeled in sand, which we have drilled and which we have got data on, but we have not booked resources on. And then below that, you see what's called the base wheeled in sand, which holds the majority of the existing oil resource, which has been appraised. And um, there's a competent person's report verifying the numbers <clears throat> um, available. And I'll go through the numbers in a minute. But what's not really been appraised properly uh, is in the base wheeled in sand. Above the A sand, there is a C sand, and that is a gas sand. Uh, and again, it is uh, aerially extensive and contains a considerable volume of gas. Beneath the, the base wielding is the Purbeck sand. Uh, and again, that's been drilled and been tested. Uh, both the lower wielding and the Purbeck contain oil. Um, and then beneath that, uh, in the source rock, and it's a very thick interval, but there is a Jurassic sandstone with enclosure in Barry Row, which has never been drilled. Uh, it's an overpressured area, and most of the original wells were drilled in the 70s, and as soon as they hit this pressure, they basically closed down the rig and said, "That's we've gone deep enough, thanks very much. Um, so you can see that um, in addition to the resources that, that make Barry Row a very large field, there are a number of sands which still need to be properly appraised, and in some cases, discovered. And, you know, we're in 100 metres of water. We're 65 kilometres offshore uh, at the mouth of the Cork port and uh, very close to one of Ireland's uh, main industrial hubs. Onshore, there's a lot of industry. There's a large marine facility which can provide us with support. And there are two 500 megawatt power stations that are gas fired. So it's a very interesting area for us to develop an oil and gas field. What I've got here, this is a recently published OGA uh, investment performance. What they look at is they look at how the UK is doing with respect to returns on investments in the offshore. And the second bar from the, the right is the UK. And basically, uh, they're comparing themselves versus a number of other basins, Brazil, Nigeria, Angola, etc. Uh, and you'll see that the, the IRR returns on investments in the UK are quite attractive. Um, 
Well, a lot of that's got to do with the the maximum economic recovery drives that that have been going on in the UK for a number of years. So development costs have come down and we believe that we can access the, those benefits as we develop Barry Row. But what you also see in the UK is that it's a mature province and most of the reserves that are being developed are quite small satellite developments that tie back into exist, existing hub platforms. But on the right hand side, what we've done here is we're, we're planning to do a phased development of Barry Row. So if you like the, the first phase, the early development scheme is possibly akin to maybe a, a, an incremental field development in the UK. We've priced things at about $55 a barrel flat and $3 an MCF. Um, oil at the moment is probably $42 at Brent, and th these are Brent. And I think it's sitting around about $5 an MCF uh, for gas. It's come up uh, quite a bit recently, but we believe those are sensible numbers. We anticipate that there will be some recovery in the oil price by then. We do believe that this is a fairly conservative price deck. Uh, and we have, however, also tested it at $40 a barrel, and the economics do remain robust. The economics that we're showing here also allow for carbon tax. Um, we anticipate that that's going to continue to appreciate uh, in, in the coming years, and, and Ireland has announced uh, an increase in carbon tax in, in the most recent budget. So we have forecast uh, carbon taxes up to about $100 a, bar, um, a, a tonne of CO2, and we've built those into the economics for the project here. The IRR greater than 40 percent, um, NPV 10, 240 million, and NPV dollars per barrel of oil, about 10.6 for the early development scheme. And it does pay back itself very quickly. We then would move on to what we call a core development, which is kind of develop it's a broader development on the eastern area, and then into a full field development. The fuel field development is very attractive and um, break evens here are probably $25 a barrel, including uh, allowances for carbon tax. So they are very economic projects and they are very conventional projects. Um, and I do believe they're the sort of things that, that um, if you're going to invest in the oil and gas uh, sort of industry, this is the type of project that you should be looking at. And the benefits of having some carbon sinks close to us really means that, that, that we can uh, evolve the business and sort of build into that uh, transition uh, gas supply and carbon capture business that, that is going to evolve over the next few years. This is a little bit more detail on the resource base. Um, we've given in place numbers for all of the discovered Sands. So you've got Lower Wealdon and Purbeck here. You add all of those together in our mid case, and you've got about 1.8 billion barrels in place. Um, we only look at recoveries on the Lower Wealdon and the Basal Wealdon, and you'll see that uh, the Lower Wealdon recovery is about 15%. We're assuming only primary recovery, but I do believe that that it will benefit from secondary recovery, and we'll see better numbers uh, on the Basal Wealdon. It's only the oil in the A sand that we've accounted for, and uh, and the recovery there uh, is assuming secondary recovery and is about 35%. So you can see we've got about 311 million barrels of oil. Uh, it's a fairly light oil, 43 API, low viscosity, um, and it's quite fizzy. Um, so we expect about another 35 million barrels of oil equivalent which is near 200 BCF of gas as associated gas. In the sea sand, we are still analyzing, but you know we, we do believe that this field is capable of producing somewhere in excess of half a TCF of gas uh, when we've fully assessed all of the, the resource base. Uh, and we still have to drill the Jurassic to, to really fully understand the potential. On the phase development for Barry Row, phase one, the early development scheme, uh, you can see that the, the field is broken up and uh, divided into panels here. And these map the, the main faults that sit across the field. The eastern panel was the, 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 the area that was drilled um, in 2012 with the 10Z appraisal well and flowed at um, 
about 400, uh, sorry, 4,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day during the test um, uh, from basically what is effectively half a Darcy uh, permeability sand. Um, and again, the oil is low viscosity, so it does flow at, at extremely good rates. Uh, we plan to drill three horizontal wells uh, and uh, and turn them into producers and put one water injector into the field uh, to begin production from, from day one. Uh, this really supersedes the original appraisal program that was contemplated during the, the APEC development. APEC were looking to do a full field development and they wanted to appraise the whole field before they just went straight into a development. We do believe this field will benefit in many ways from a, a phased development approach um, and we believe that the cash flows that come from that development will allow us to fund future development without actually having to recourse to debt um, because the the field is is very attractive economically so the focus initially will be on the eastern panel and then in phase two the eastern core area is really the eastern panel the southern uh, central panel and the, the central north panel, sorry, central south and central north panels. Uh, and then we would move into the to the broader area after we've completed those successfully. This is a, a schematic of the of the SP, um, FPSO and the FSO. As I said previously, three production wells, 200 meter horizontals approximately, which we've modeled. Uh, into the A reservoir. Uh, we don't anticipate producing the gas during the early development scheme. We anticipate re-injecting the gas um, to minimize flaring associated with it. Uh, and again, injection well, subsea production, uh, manifolded back to the FPSO, and we would be batch shipping uh, crude oil uh, through uh, tanker offtake. We anticipate the processing capability, oil removal, gas removal, gas reinjection, power generation, and we also need to have flow insurance in place because we are dealing with a waxy crude. I think one of the one of the main things to take from this presentation really is the evolution of the uh, work program versus what has been previously spoken about, and it's taken us a little while to really get to what we consider to be the right scheme. Um, I'll talk more about the, the farm out and spot on energy in a few minutes, but fundamentally um, they work with a number of very uh, good quality service providers uh, who are incentivized to work with them. And um, they really need to commit to what they consider to be the right work program for the field. So a lot of the time over the last six months has been spent ensuring that we've got the work program right uh, ensuring that the costs for that work program are, are well developed and, and also making sure that the that service providers are willing to defer some of their payments into the production uh, period for the project um, uh, because by doing that they're effectively helping us to underwrite the quality of the project that we're looking to develop. Uh, without that we wouldn't be in a position to really move forward uh, at the pace that we want to. Okay, in terms of pace, you've you've um, probably only got. Oh, out, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you I'll give you an additional two minutes because a lot of the questions are associated with the uh, the farm out. Okay, well, that's fine. All right, look, um, my apologies for getting into my subject too deeply. Uh, the full field development potential. This slide was originally put together in two thousand and twelve. It pretty much looks like the way that the field would eventually be developed. The rig on the right hand side is the Maersk Innovator. It's a jack up rig and it's one of the rigs that we're planning to use for the project. In terms of the fiscal regime in Ireland, it's very attractive. Corporate tax is 25% and then there's a profit resources rent tax of up to 15% depending on profitability. Providence is invested heavily in Ireland, so we have got losses which we can offset against the capital expenditure for the field. The farm out, um, we have got some very good quality service providers and fundamentally they defer a large proportion of their fees into production uh, and receive uh, a royalty for the life of the field from the production as an incentive to do that. 
and it's also a life of field contract for servicing and subsequent developments. So it's a long-term investment by us and it's a long-term investment by them. And everybody needs to make sure that we're going to do the field right in order to achieve that. The most likely drilling site will be the A site. Uh, it's already approved. And the K site, which is a possible alternative, but I think it's a bit too much up dip, uh, is going through approvals at the moment and they'll be closed out shortly. I will skip over the ESG side, but, but we have introduced uh, the triple bottom line. We recognize that to get this project done effectively, we need to be very conscious of the environment and we need to bring our local uh, communities along with us. And we are investing time and effort in that upfront. Sustainable development, I think I've covered uh, basically through the, um, the carbon capture and storage. And what you see here, is a little cartoon which really looks at putting Barry Row together with some depleted gas fields, bringing the gas ashore, um, putting it through power stations, capturing the CO2, putting it through steam reforming to generate blue hydrogen and capturing the CO2, putting the hydrogen into the gas circuit, and then basically bringing that CO2 back offshore in order to re-inject it. This is a similar system to the one that's being used in Teesside, Humberside, and also the high, wet, high net northwest project up in the northeast of England. The benefit that we have is that we've got gas to supply to it rather than uh, gas being imported to actually uh, to, to underpin it. But it's, it could be very exciting if we're able to move that and get government support for it. Just finally on exploration, we've got a lot of licenses in the North Celtic Sea. We have existing discoveries. There's not a lot of seismic and there aren't many wells drilled recently in the North Celtic Sea. We do believe it is very attractive from an exploration perspective and we would like to uh, ensure that we fully work that up. One thing I did want to say, and it's quite important for, for the listeners, the farm out, we do believe we're on track to progress as we had indicated when we entered into the period of exclusivity with Spot On. Um, we are uh, making good progress. There has been a lot of work to get through in order to work through the work program, the commercial terms, and uh, and also the, the costings for the project. Uh, we had to get that right, uh, but, but I'm pleased that we are in a pretty good place with that at the moment. And finally, uh, just a recap, and I don't have time to do it, so you can read it yourselves. You are a proper Glaswegian blether. Um, I know, I know. I, so I, I, look, I, I, I love the subject and I, I, have, I find this project very exciting. Uh, it's one of the, it, 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 it continues to surprise me when I look at it that it's not been done before. It really does. Yeah. And as you said, one of the key takeaways from this presentation is the evolution of the work program. Now, just before today's presentation kicked off, um, Malcolm Graham Wood, Malky uh, wrote, he's, and I think his summary is pretty accurate from what I've gleaned from you tonight. Uh, Malky said, so the plan is phased development of the Barry Row <laughs> gas and oil resources with partners capable of funding the development work program. They will establish early production and cash flow and minimize overall development risk. That sounds pretty pretty accurate as far that as sounds, he must have been recording me when I spoke to him. That sounds very much like what I would say. Okay, so I'm glad you, you got to the farm up bit. Uh, Stephen Barrett says how much what percentage of the field do you expect to retain after the spot on deal completes? Yeah. I that is commercially sensitive, but what I would say is quite a large proportion. So we're 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 not we're not giving away the farm. Good. Otherwise, you'd have nothing to blether about. Okay, so you keep exactly. quite a large proportion. Very good. Uh, Mark Barber asks, how much of the early development project funding do you anticipate to be met by the Norwegian export credit facility? And assuming a successful farm out, 
how does the joint venture consortium intend to fund the balance? So two questions there, which I'm going to broadcast to the room so you can take them piece by piece. So how much of the project funding, the early bit, will be made by the Norwegian Export Credit Facility, first of all? Well, the way the Norwegian Export Credit Facility works is that any works that, that are commissioned, which are exported out of Norway, so, you know, a number of our consortium members are Norwegian firms, so all of the work that they do is Norwegian content. Um, but they can deploy uh, some of that work overseas, um, and it still counts against the, the Norwegian export credit. Uh, but it's got to have, it has to qualify. Um, and what happens is basically the, uh, we would put up 20% of the capital that's required uh, for that Norwegian content and Norwegian export credit uh, will provide up to 80% of the balance uh, of the funding that's required. Um, I can't get into the exact numbers at the moment, but you can see that it's quite a large proportion that potentially comes from Norwegian export credit. Um, most of the most of the balance of the funding really comes from deferred costs and we will top that up with um and what sorry we won't top it up spot on we'll top that up uh we anticipate going to the bond market to to uh, raise some bond funding in order to get the balance of the financing understood but, um you know it's a low risk project and uh when we uh when we spoke to um, and Pareto Securities are the are the bank who you know are expert in this uh, the, in this arena, and you know their their indication at that time, given the economy, was that you know the, the, the markets really won't be that interested before October to to be investing in this kind of a, a, a sector. Um, so we we've always targeted the end of October through November to actually go to the bond markets for that particular part of the funding. What we had to ensure that we were doing prior to that was make sure that we had all of the additional commitments in place so that we knew exactly what that bond needed to be. And that's what Spot On and, and, and ourselves have been working on uh, and the consortium has been working on uh, for the last six months. Well, Ewan White is the man after my own heart in terms of recycling. Um, he says, to what extent do the economics that you've showed depend upon the reuse of existing infrastructure? What access to this do you currently have? Does anything need to be constructed? Yeah, look, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good question and, and there, there maybe two answers. I think the, the conceal head platforms which are out there are, are pretty old and really need to be removed and I, and I wouldn't want to inherit them. Uh, the gas pipeline which runs from Seven Heads to the to the Inch Terminal on shore uh, is in very good condition and, and it's a pipeline that, that if we can probably make use, possibly make use of that facility we would like to for two reasons. One, uh, it means that we're not digging up uh, the land and, and making new steel in order to make a new pipeline and it means they don't have to use the energy to actually uh, sort of remove it. Um, so, so from a from a recycling point of view, the the, the main benefit would be if we can utilise the pipeline. Uh, with respect to the actual um, wells, we have to drill new wells on Barrier Row, so that will be new equipment. Um, the FPSO, you could argue, will be a recycle because it will be redeployed from from another field. Um, that's kind of it, really. That's okay. There's plenty more questions. Oh. Early, on in the, <laughs> early on in the presentation, you were speaking about, you know, government buy-in, obviously. Um, Andrew Russell's got to write down to the nitty gritty of the departments involved. He said, the site survey sign off. Crikey, she sells seashells. The site survey sign off seems to be taking longer than usual. Are you in contact with the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment in relation to this? And when do you anticipate a decision? Um, it, it is taking a long time. Um, the last one that we did at this, at this point took 15 days. 
This one's taken 90 days. Uh, the reason it's taken 90 days is because there was no government for a large proportion of that period, so there was really nobody to sign off on it. And then there was the programme for government, and then it took a, a while to get the new government in place. Uh, that generated quite a backlog within, we call it the PAD, but but it, it's, a it's a subset of the Department of Climate Action, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they're, they're, I've spoken to them recently. They are processing it, and there, there's no reason to believe that it will be delayed longer than it needs to be. It's not critical path on our project, so it's not something I'm losing sleep or getting irritated about. Uh, but what it does do for me is it is it sort of flags that uh, it's really important that we initiate all of the permitting work that we need in order to be out there drilling and uh, and developing the field we get that kicked off very quickly, very early, um, so that we don't see delays. I think that's your takeaway, just arrived. So last question uh, from me. Um, you talked about you not losing sleep over the that issue. What is making you lose sleep at the moment? Nothing really. I, 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 yeah, I, uh, I sleep well. I you know, we're, 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 look, we're, we're, we're doing our work properly here and, um, you know, with Spot On Energy, uh, you know, you've got a group there that on average has 35 years experience in the oil and gas industry. They're working with six world class service providers and what we're all working to do is make sure that the project that we believe is achievable and that we believe in here is put together and, and developed. Um, the permitting processes in Ireland are are extensive, but the you know there is a process. It's not as if it's made up as it goes along. So we we believe that we can work our way through that. What we do need to do is dot all the i's and cross all the t's and not and not leave ourselves open to being accused of not having done our job properly. So if we do everything properly and do it professionally, and if we engage and consult with the, the local communities that we're working with, I soon see no reason why we can't bring domestic oil and domestic gas to Ireland for, uh, you know, just just think how, how, what sort of support that's going to give to an economy that, that's coming out of, uh, you know, of a, of, of a COVID recession. You know, it really is potentially very positive for the economy. You're a wonderful ambassador, but you're also the first chief executive I have ever met who has got a clear conscience. Alan. Well, that's a, that, you, you, you clearly haven't been meeting the right chief executives. <laughs> Alan Scott Lynn, chief executive of Providence Resources. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.